Hi everyone, I'm Dave Dustin. I'm a comic collector and a comic historian from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I'm making this video for you. It's gonna be pretty cool. We're gonna have a mail call where it's an actual surprise even for me. I only know half of the books that are inside of this box. The other half, I have no idea what it contains, but it's gonna be really awesome. What I'm gonna be doing is also teaching you a bit about the comic history of Canada and also of Bailey Publications in the United States, in New York, and how their books were distributed east of London, England, into the United Kingdom back in 1946. And we're gonna actually be completely rewriting comic history with this. That's why I got this mail call, is so that I could be the one to actually change the history that has been written about these comics, what has been published in books and in online, completely wrong so far. But I know the actual history of Superior Comics and Century Publications from researching this and searching for them for the last two years now. And this is about the culmination of all my research. We're going to go over it. Oh, before I even get into this, I'm just going to tell everyone a bit of a history about the comics at the time, for those who don't know. So, at the time, we're talking about the 1940s, World War II is going on. There were import bans into Canada called the War Exchange Conservation Act. So you could not import American comics or any unessential goods into Canada at the time. So in the, during the World War II to the 1940s, Canadian whites are the comics that dominated up here. They were all black and white interior comics, and it was all Canadian published, written, artwork, just pure Canadian content. And they were around the, from the end of 1940 until 1945, they flourished here in Canada. In the UK, they had the same sort of thing. There was an import ban on American non-essential goods also. You could not publish American comics in the UK at the time. So they had their own homegrown talent also making comics throughout the 40s where they had you know, pure British drawn and written books. And they could not get the American comics over except for when they were brought over by the American military had bases over there and the American military would bring over their American comics, and that's how the British public saw their comics. But they could not publish them over there. So this was all going good well until the end of the war, and then in 1946, everything really started ramping up for the American comics, and all the servicemen were back, they were publishing a lot more comics. But in 1946, there was still an import ban, and any comic back then at all was super rare because there was paper was being rationed, there were paper shortages throughout the war and even after the war. And people after the war, they wanted American comics. They wanted full color comics. So what happened here in Canada is the Canadian whites were not black and white anymore. They started publishing those in color. But they only lasted to 1946 and into 1947, then they all stopped producing. They shut down, American comics took over, Trade restrictions eased in 1947, 1948. You could bring in printing materials to print American comics in Canada here. So Superior Comics was purely reprinting American published stuff throughout all the 1950s. Over in Britain, you still couldn't get American comics there either. But here's what happened is in 1946, to circumvent these rules and get around these import restrictions is Superior Comics, known as Century Publications, actually bought a whole pile of artwork from Bailey Publishing in New York and the United States. And they here in Canada, in Toronto, they published all this American pre-made comics. They published them to be solely distributed over in London, England, and they sent them all over there. So that's how they got American comics that were created in the States into the UK, is by having them published in Canada and shipped over to the UK for sale. Now, a lot of the comics that they sent over during that first batch in 1946 were self-covered comics. So this means they were published with no covers on them. They were published with just the contents, the interior story pages of the cover of the comics were inside. They overprinted uh, uh, the word comics or whatnot as a title onto the book, and they overprinted the indicia and a price of a British price, 6D, then they were usually stickered after that as a shilling, even, and they sold them over there as Canadian published books. And that's how they got these American comics over there. Now, 
little bit of history on Bernard Bailey. So Bernard Bailey began with uh, Iger and Eisner, and that was an American publishing company that back in the 40s, maybe even the 30s, they prepackaged comics and sold them to smaller publishers for smaller publishers just entering the field to be able to publish. And that's where Bernard Bailey works. Bernard Bailey, I know him best for um, this cover here. He was an artist. He did Mr. Mystery number 12 with the injury to the eye cover there. That was by Bernard Bailey. Now, Bernard Bailey, he created his own company. In 1943, Bernard Bailey founded the publishing company Bailey Publications and the packager Bernard Bailey Studio. The latter concern, which lasted through 1946, was the outsourced producer of such comics as the single issue Star Studded Comics and Gold Medal Comics. Now, on Wikipedia, it names all these publishers that he provided comics for. It includes Rural Home Publishing Imprint Croydon, J. Burris Narrative, Lindsay Baird, Feature Comics, Neo Publications, Spotlight Comics Imprint, Leffingwell, Holyoke. But it doesn't mention their biggest client of all, which was Century Publications, known as also Superior Comics. They published almost everything that Bailey Publications put out. They, pu they published here in Canada, and it was never distributed in North America at all. It was only distributed in the UK, so nobody knows about these comics. That's how super rare you are. It's not even mentioned on Wikipedia. Now, something else that's really cool about Bernard Bailey is you're going to see is all these comics that were in the first line of Century Publications that were done by Bailey. A lot of the artwork was done by an artist named John Gianta. And at the time, in 1944, 1945, he was working with a 15 and 16 year old assistant. Frank Frazetta. Frank Frazetta, really well known artist in our comics. This is probably his best known EC work, the cover for Weird Science Fantasy number 29, May 1955. It was meant for famous funnies. It was a Buck Rogers cover, but it was deemed too graphic. So Buck Rogers refused to publish this cover. It was then bought by DC Comics and they published it on the cover of Weird Science Fantasy. He did a whole bunch of work with a Collaborating with other artists and other EC stories in their comic. Fantastic artist. So, as 15, 16 year old, Frank Frazetta had his hands on a lot of this artwork as he was doing the cleanups, the erasers, and whatnot. So, that's really cool to have a connection there with Frank Frazetta. Now, what you're going to see here also is in these comics, when we're talking about the first horror comic published in Canada, you're going to see the second, uh, the Frank Frazetta's first actual. Uh, professional artwork is going to be in Tally Hall with Snowman Comics. We're going to see all the Bailey Publishing archives. I'm going to go over and I'm going to go over all the original art and the stuff sold at Weiss Auctions. If anyone bought anything from Weiss Auctions recently from the Bailey Publishing archives, all of the archives that they auctioned off stated on them probably not published. When in fact it was almost entirely published. Everything silver printed was published but up here in Canada. So anyone at Weiss Auctions is completely unaware that these were actually published, and they were. Anyone who bought this artwork is also unaware that these are actually published comics. They just don't know about them because they're so extremely rare. There's almost none here in North America. The only few of these comics here are the ones that collectors like me imported from the UK and brought them over here. So anyway, let's get to this mail call. I'm real excited about this. I'm gonna open this up. Okay, there we have it. Get this open. Now, this is the mail call that I've been waiting for. 
this as you will see, is full of 1946 Century Publication Comics. So what this is, I've no, I have no idea what all is in here so far, but this is actually what I haven't told you is a bound volume from the Dennis Gifford collection. So what was listed on the seller listed here is uh, Canadian coverless comic books were imported to the 1940s UK mainly with an overprint stamp on the first page and sold on as regular comics on market stalls and news agents. The late comics historian collector Dennis Gifford collected these imported papers and had them bound into thick volumes of which this is one. This volume has 17 comics and 700 pages within its blue heart covers. So I know what eight of these 17 comics are. The other nine I have no idea whatsoever what the comics are that are featured in here. But we're going to go through them all. And I'm going to also now tell you about a couple other things I found. So when searching for these comics and information about them, I found that there is only two items printed anywhere about these Canadian comics. So the first thing I found was I found an article on Comic Book Daily website about Century Publications. This was published November 6, 2013 by Ivan Kokmerich. And it is about the 1946 comic publisher Century Publications in Toronto. But what he has uh, written in the article, if you search it up, is, uh, is there's a picture actually of a house ad for the comics. And I quote in there, uh, examples of the coverless remainder century titles from a book on Canadian nostalgia whose source information I've lost track of. That was from the book Nostalgia About Comics, and we'll get to that in a sec. And the ad that they show is this ad here. And you'll see it's got six different comics inside the ad. And at the bottom there's a paragraph listed. And there's the cover. It is Nostalgia About Comics. And the funniest thing of all is this book, Nostalgia About Comics, was compiled by and published by Gifford, Phil Clark and my pigs. Phil Clark is who I bought this bound volume from off of eBay. Now, inside this ad that's inside his book, there's a paragraph. And the paragraph says, a selection of Canadian coverless comics that could be bought in the UK during the 40s. The majority of these were remainders. The retailer would rip off the covers as proof of unsold copies, but instead of scrapping the contents, they would be packaged up and used as ballast. Upon entry to these shores, they were then sold either without the original covers or occasionally with special fake covers printed for them. Zorro the Mighty, number one, second row, center, appears to be one of these, so it actually had a cover. But Zorro number two, second row, right, and the rest of the comics on the page seem to have been packaged without covers and had the Century Publications logo overprinted on the splash page. Superior Publishers and Century seem to be the same company as both names appear on the various comics. Superior Century Publications were distributed in the UK by Streamline Books Limited of London. It seems that because Bell Comics, see previous page as Bell Features, were distributed from Manchester and Superior from London, then the former was more prominent in the South, while the bulk of the latter found its way to Northern outlets. Different prices seem to have been charged for these comics in different areas. And bottom right, an example of a lurid splash page from inside one of these comics, which is the Satanist, which is from the Zora Mighty number two. Now, this whole paragraph, this is the only thing I've found anywhere, published in any book ever, that is about these 1946 self-covered comics. And it is completely wrong. It talks of remainder comics, and this is the thought process that everybody had, up, even up till now that they figured that these Canadian comics were remaindered and the cover 
orders were ripped off, and because they went unsold, they were then shipped over as ballast on boats and sold over in the UK instead, but did not sell here. And the, the co they had covers originally that were removed for the retailers to get money back. This is what happened to comics here in North America is the top third of the comic, the masthead or the title, would be cut off and then the distributors would get compensated for unsold copies. These are not remainder comics. These were published without covers to begin with. So therefore the first page is now the cover, which is considered to be a self-covered comic. But these had no covers to begin with. They are not remaindered. But because everyone thought that these were remaindered copies, everyone thought for all these years, since 1946, these were just junk. These are just poor, incomplete, tattered comics. The covers were ripped off. They are worthless. People threw them out in droves. They just got rid of them. People didn't want them. They wanted the shiny, glossy cover on American comics. They did not want these pulp covers. Okay, so they thought that these were just remainders. They thought, you know, people just threw these out all over the place. Like, comics were thrown out enough as is, but then for comics to come out without covers, they were already thought to be incomplete and poor, and they were just thrown out to the point that there's practically none left. People don't even know what these things are, because they were thrown out so much of them, and they had tiny print runs to begin with. Century Publications, this is their first attempt at publishing comic books. And they've tried out in international waters. So they're just doing a tiny, tiny little print run to be able to test their feet in international waters and see if these things will sell. These are not remainder comics. Now, you can see also on that uh, Nostalgia Vault Comics site, they have shown a couple of advertisements that are there. Here's an ad. This ad here is actually from Jeep Comics number two. And I have a copy of this. And it is a house ad for Century Publications. And it is for Zora the Mighty, number one, Jeep Comics number one, Twinkle, Space Nomads, and Circus Comics. So this in Jeep number two is advertising Jeep number one being for sale because they had already both come out in the States in Canada, they had got the artwork for both at the same time, so they had both on sale at the same time. But you can see these thumbnails are very highly accurate to the actual covers on these comics. If you find the comics, they're they are slightly different, very, very accurate though. And then that ad on Comic Daily pointed to a, sorry, that the, the website pointed to this other ad and here's an ad from Circus Comics. It's almost the exact same. But instead of Century Publication, it lists better grade publications. And then, got Slapstick, Trophy, Spook, Tally Ho, and Make Believe. And then all the rest of the ad is the exact same house ad that was in a Century Publication comic for Century Publication books. There is no history of better grade publications anywhere. I cannot find anything suggesting that this company ever existed. And these are all series of books made by Bailey Publications. So it appears that they are just masking Bailey Publications with this better grade publications. None of the books in this series display this trademark better grade anywhere on them. They are all overprinted. Century Publications, Superior Comic. Some have Crestwood. That's just the Spook and Tally Ho. Better grade, as far as anyone knows, does not exist. But in the ad that is on that comic book daily, also, to read that, oh, here it is. It had stated in underneath this picture a similar ad from the Century Edition of Circus Comics, which is come on this ad here. And here is Circus Comics, the British edition. It says, the, the books listed in this ad are all unfamiliar to me and were perhaps British comics since I don't think they had counterparts in Canada.
Canada or the United States. This is by Ivan Kochner again on comic vision. These are all series of comics that were created by Bailey Publications in New York, in the United States. None of these were meant to be one-shots. These were all meant to be actual series, and they made up artwork for two, three issues of each of these series. But most of them just had, or all of them, just had one comic published in each. So I found all these comics, and I'll show you what they are. This is produced by Bailey. There is Slapstick, and here is Slapstick Comics. Cover. Trophy. Here is a cover to Trophy Comics. Now this is by John Gianta, which means it was probably assisted by Frank Frazetta with the cleanups, like all the other artwork done by John Gianta. This cover was never used, unfortunately, because Trophy Comics, number one, was published without a cover. And there was artwork for other Trophy Comics that also was not published. Notice how the cover looks nothing like this. It's got a picture of a flying horse. I don't know, that's a unicorn, but it's nothing at all like Trophy Comics. Whereas all the other pictures actually look like the covers. The cover in, is put on Trophy Comics, and I just found this out recently, it appears to be from Little Sir Richard, which is stories made by Bailey Publishing. I have not found any that have been actually published, unless they are in Circus Comics, which I don't have. There are some stories like this, it might be in there. But there is the flying horse image that they used in the ad from Little Sir Richard. Then you have Spook Comics, and here's the actual Spook Comics number one. This was the first published Canadian horror comic, and we'll get to that as well. You can see it doesn't have the devil, it's got a big purple monster instead, but it has the monster's eyeballs. The pupils are in the O's for the pupils in the word spook, and here we have eyes in the O's for the word spook. Tally Ho is Tally Ho, published by Bailey, and there's Snowman by Frank Frazetta, his first published work. There's a snowman. And then Make Believe, this took a while to find also, but I found it on the cover. That is Zor the Mighty, swinging from vines on the cover. Make Believe is another series by Bailey Publications where it had artwork created, but as far as I know, they never published any of the Make Believe series. Okay, so now we'll look at what's actually in this book, because I have no idea what's actually in here, so this is going to be fun. Now, this is funny too, because this is from the Dennis Gifford collection. Dennis Gifford, he was an artist in the 40s, and he is an author of a whole bunch of books. And you'd think that you'd find his, these comics in at least one of his books. I have a couple here. I have the complete catalog of British comics, and because these are not British um, published, they're not included in there. It's only the published British comics, these are published in Canada. But you figure you might find in this other book of his, the International Book of Comics by Dennis Gifford. But in here, the only Canadian comics are Canadian whites. He does not have any of these books in his collection, in his personal bound collection, featured in here because, like I said, him, like everyone else, figured that these are just incomplete, poor, remaindered copies. They're totally worthless, and they were not written about in any book. Nobody ever actually looked into the history of these books and investigated it before. Even noted authors that had the collection. Anyway, we'll get into this book here now. So, what we have... First is Boogeyman. Right. I'll tell you what I think this is because I have the Lord of the Mighty number two, I believe. Was it? Oh no, it was not. I don't even know what comic this is then. I swear I've seen this before. Let's see what the next story is. First page. I have no idea what this is. The Sorcerer and His Apprentice. 
Just doing all right. Pretty tall. Sergeant Strong. <laughs> Passing the buck. Captain Milksaw. Igloo Iggy and Satanus. Where have I seen that boogeyman? So there's another boogeyman in Triple Cross. The first layer of the boogeyman story. Actually, I think I know. I think I remember. I think it had to do with Zord Might. Yes. So, okay. So that the first book, it had a cover. This was Zor the Mighty Comics number two. And then I found this online. When you look inside Zora the Mighty Comics number two, the first story, Boogeyman. There it is. So this was a comic that had a cover. It was Zora the Mighty number two. The cover was removed. And but it actually had a cover. Now Century Publications, they mix and match their covers with all kinds of different books, which is a complete nightmare. They had the cups they had, they put on books that had nothing to do with the interiors whatsoever. Even though they had the interiors, they put a cover on to something totally different. It makes no sense. But this is Zor the Mighty number two. Somebody had removed the cover. Team Sweeney. Captain Milksop. This is like another another boogeyman. Deals the cards. Saul Bailey. Satan is again. Is he new? Yeah. Another boogeyman. Okay, so that. What's funny about this is this I have found on the GCD on the Grand Comics database. And this is the first page of a different book. So on the Grand Comic Database, they have this one overprinted, a Century publication across the top. Boogeyman, published by Century Publishing Company, 232 Benda Street, West Toronto, Ontario, Canada, volume one, number two, 1946, printed in Canada. But there is no indicia printed on this book. Strange. Draws the Vapor, the Sorcerer's Apprentice. I don't know, I think we're still in the same book. I don't even know anymore. Another Satanus? These are all these Red Band comics. Captain Wizard. Okay, so here's another one. This, I believe, mean, is a whole other comic now. I don't know for sure, <laughs> but Bailey Publishing did have this Captain Wizard Comics, which I believe this is now the first story of this book, Captain Wizard Comics, another John Jump cover, so it's probably peanuts if I try to do that. Okay. 
Another Dr. Mercy. I have a Dr. Mercy. Not that one. A little different book. Yeah, so here's a Dr. Mercy I have. Okay, but I think that one's in here also. O'Leary. Didn't care in that one thing. The Whispered Fate of Story. Grace Wilkins. I read that title somewhere. I don't know if it's just being written in circus comics. Impossible Man. Captain Wizard. Oh, it's another Captain Wizard. Yeah, because of this. Yeah. I don't know if that's this Captain Wizard. And that was a different one. I don't I don't even know what these books are. I'm going to have to do a lot of research now that I'm opening this up for the first time. This is pretty crazy. I have no idea. This, as far as I know, this is all entirely Bailey Publishing artwork. This we printed up here in Canada, so the world has no idea about it. Another Team McSween story there. Crosstown. Another Grace Wilkins. Another impossible man? Another Captain Wizard? <laughs> I had no idea there's so many Captain Wizard stories. Yeah. I don't know, this might be a whole other comic now. I have no idea where these comics started and because a whole bunch of these have had no covers. Battle of Behemoths, another Race Wolfen story. Another Impossible Man. Duke of Darkness. This might be another start of another comic as well. As I know, Bailey Publishing put out Top Spot Comics with the Duke of Darkness. So this might be the first page of this comic. I'll have to check into this as well. I have no idea. Duke of Darkness. Gag. Airmail and Stampy cancelled out. Professor Jabberwacky. Seems like a destroyer. Bone Grummel? Never heard of. Okay, so here's a comic where it actually has the cover. I think this is the only comic in the whole thing that actually has a cover. So this is Star Studded Comics, 128 pages, 32 smash features. Captain Combat. I've never read any of this, but I've never had this book, so I've never read any of these stories either. I have no idea. This is going to be a lot of fun reading all this stuff. Figure Without Pixie.
ghost woman? Mysterious Mystery, Jiu-Jitsu Joe, Dipsy Doodle, Mr. Paradise, Mr. Sack, and these all still star set of comics, still have the titles on top, 128 pages, Kiss of Death, Mr. and Mrs. Punch, Mystery Robin Raleigh Desperate Dennis Major Domo Possum Pete. Nosy Rosie, Western Quiz, Hocus and Pocus, Steve, still in Star Study Comics, this is a big, the big volume, 128 pages, <laughs> uh, Tom and Beck, Bright Spark, Adventure Otter, Puppy Maguire, Dodo the Clown, Three Friends, Red Rogue, Sven Valley. Okay, so this is a different book now. So we're this, that was the end of Star Studded Comics. Page 128, there's no back cover. And now we are into the story Sven Gali, apparently. I have no idea what book this is from. I have not seen any of this before. This doesn't work anywhere. I have no idea. Sven Gali. Marty and Matt. Again, this is probably all Bailey Publishing, because I've never seen the original artwork for this, or seen the book this was published in. And there's no overprint. On the first page, which is strange. And keys. This is Green Man. It's strange that none of these comics have big overprints. Uh, every comic before I found has an overprint. I've never found one that did not have the overprinting. The Crimson Admiral. I think we've got some really cool books coming up too, by the way. I know it's coming. Here's one that's really, really awesome. I must say, this here, this is the first horror comic published in Canada. And by horror comic, I mean anthology horror comic. This is published 1946, if you look here. Mr. Lucifer and Off Puffs the Devil. They overprinted with comics. They overprinted the price 6B. And in the initia. Mr. Lucifer Comics is published by Crestwood Publishing Company, 26 Denison Square, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Printed in Canada, all material copyrighted in Canada. This is the first horror comic published here in Canada. And I'll show you some information I have with this. This is actually really cool. I really like this. Here's my copy, Mr. Lucifer Comics. See mine, the 6D price stamp is covered over with a shilling sticker, but everything else, exact same. Found this on eBay earlier this year or last year. Really, really awesome to be able to have this. I've only ever seen one other copy of this. Two years ago, there was one that was on the internet on eBay. Somebody was selling it for $250. 
It was the only copy of this book that I've seen ever for sale in Canada. But the person was selling a bunch of other British stuff that was imported along with this. So they imported this comic with a bunch of other stuff from the UK and they were selling stuff just outside of Toronto in, in another city close by. But it was imported by them. It was not because it was bought here. It's they brought it over, they sold it here. I don't know how much it sold for. It was in kind of rougher condition than this one. This one, pretty nice shape, one page inside had the crease, you know, but to have the first horror comic published in Canada here is fantastic. Now, what this comic is, you know, it is Spook Comics number one published by Daily Publishing Company in New York, United States. Spook Comics. Here is the original cover art also, if you look at that. There's the original cover art for Spook Comics, right there. This sold November 19th, 2020 from Weiss Auctions, lot number 373, $8,500 for that original cover art by John Gianta. And because it was done, 1945, this was probably had cleanups done by Frank Frazetta as a 15, 16 year old boy. So Frank Frazetta probably worked on the first Canadian published horror comic. Now, when I say his first Canadian published horror comic, like a lot of people have different opinions on what a horror comic is. Okay, so a lot of people will say that if you look it up online, horror comics, the first dedicated horror comic appeared to be Classic Comics number 13, August 1943. That's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Okay. And a lot of people say, that's the first horror comic, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 1943. But it's a classic story that they added illustrations to. It's all one big long story, the whole comic. Really not that horrific. Yeah. But you know, people, some people say that, that's fine, people can like that as their first horror comic. But I'm talking about anthology horror comics, like the classic 50s horror comic where it has you know, multiple stories, four or five stories inside, all have to be of the horror genre. They have to all be horror, cover to cover. The cover has to be a horror cover. This meets the criteria that this is the first horror comic. A lot of people will also say, and it's said online, that eerie comics, Number one by Avon is the first anthology horror comic. And it's been stated here by Ron Goulart, historian, that it was the first out and out horror comic book. You know, why I think they said that Eerie is the first horror comic is all the horror comics inside are horrific horror. Whereas Spook Comics has some comedic horror inside. It has stories for little kiddies. It's a comic book. It's meant for kids. It can have comedy and mix into the horror. That's perfectly fine by me. I mean, like, in EC Comics, you have the three lunatics. They mix in the comedy with the horror all the time. They do it perfectly. No one has a problem with the comedy in EC Horror Comics. I don't have any problem with the comedy inside Spook Comics. Oh, here's another classic. This one I have with Frankenstein in it. Once again, it's not an anthology horror comic. Now, if you want to read Spook Comics, I really... Mr. Lucifer there is the first story. A real quick, cheap, easy way. IW Super reprinted. Spook Comics number one in this. This is called Eerie number one, 1958 by IW Enterprises Inc., which is IW Super Comics. They just reprinted a whole bunch of stuff illegally because they got all the printing plates and they had no permission to reproduce stuff, but they reproduced all kinds of comics anyway. The cover is actually not the proper cover. Of course, it's not Spook Comics cover. This cover here is actually from Strange Worlds number six, and the cover is by Wally Wood before EC Comics. Really awesome cover by Wally Wood. I like it. Strange Worlds number six cover, and they took the eerie title and they put it on the book, but what's inside is Spook Comics. And it's a really cheap way to be able to read all the stories. And just to show you what kind of stories there are inside Spook Comic, how it is the first horror comic. Like we got Mr. Lucifer, Off Pops the Devil. So that's kind of a young adult horror style comic. Here's like what I said about the kids. Gregory the Ghost, still a ghost story. That's horror, it's got a ghost in it. Keep flipping through. Cheapskate, they got monsters. It's a monster story. 
Dr. Paul Bearer. Monster Stories. It's still horror. Obi makes Jumbie. Here's another young adult horror comic. This is about zombies. It's a zombie story. Cover the cover. This is all horror. Cover to cover. Spook Comics is all horror. Cover to cover. It is, in my opinion, the first horror comic published here in Canada. Right here. Mr. Lucifer Comics. Now, the first Canadian published horror comic with all Canadian content would be Journey into Fear. Journey into Fear number one, May 1951. That is a Canadian comic, Canadian content. But this here was produced by American artists. Daily Publications, Spook Comics number one, it is still, this was published in 1946 here in Canada. Looks like the other one, it was, so 1946 Canada, it was actually, the first Spook Comics in the States was 1945 that this was published in the States. And Erie number one was not published till 1947. Two years later, and a year after the Canadian edition. So, another thing that's very strange about this, I don't know if somebody else wants to look into this, but I could not find any information for some reason. Tally Ho and Who Comics are in India. Initially, they're listed as Crestwood Publishing Company, 26 Denison Square, Toronto. Now, only these two comics have that address and that publisher name. The name Crestwood Publishing, and this is not Prize Crestwood from the United States as they did uh, Black Magic and Frankenstein comics. This is a Canadian company that there's no record of their existence. There is no Crestwood Publishing information about them anywhere ever existing in Toronto. And this is in the same ad as the other daily publishing stuff put out by Century Publications, Superior Comics. So this is Century Publication Comics. Guaranteed, 100%. It's in their advertisement. Why does it have Crestwood? I have no idea. If someone could look into that, that'd be fantastic. But I don't know. But when you check out 26 Denison Square in Toronto, the actual address is the left half of this house here. It's row townhousing that's attached, and on, that's attached, the other wall is attached to a synagogue, a church. So the first horror comic about Mr. Lucifer, the devil, was published in a house that borders the wall with a church <laughs> of all places. But yeah, if anyone wants to look into that, like I don't know if this was maybe one of the publishers lived there. These were actual houses in Toronto. They were just little houses. It was like you would not have a printing press inside this house. It's in this area of Toronto where it's called Kensington Market and people did have little shops on the main floor and they lived upstairs. So it's entirely possible that this was a business on the main floor and they lived in the upstairs. Or it could just be the house that they resided in. Some are just houses where the publisher, the owner or whatnot of Century Publications maybe lived there. And this might have been like the first two comics that they ever came out with. They put the publisher's home address. Once again, I don't know, there's no information about Crestwood in Canada ever existing. So now I'm like, I'm, while we're going through this, I also don't know what to call these comics. So we go with Indicia first. The Indicia is Mr. Lucifer Comics. Technically, it's Spook Comics, the Canadian edition. They added the word comics to the under here underneath the title. So this is the title of the first story, is Mr. Lucifer. And then they put the word comics. So it indicated Mr. Lucifer Comics, and that's what they put in the edition. But they're not all like that, and I'll show you as we go through. Here's first ever published horror comic. Here in Canada, as the first horror comic, full horror, end to end, cover to cover, that was ever distributed in the UK, in London, England. And I, in my opinion, it's the first horror comic published anywhere in the United States. It beats out Eerie Comics by two years. Gregory the Ghost, Death in the Bathtub, Cheapskate, Dr. Paul Bearer, Obi Makes Jumbie. He said it's all horror. And so like that was all horror. That would have been marketed as a horror comic. If you think about it, like this is daily publishing, they're making these books for other publishers. So they're seeing other publishers, okay, here's our line of books. We've got here's a romance book, here's a western book, here's a teen book, here's a funny animal book. 
here's a horror comic. That's how it would have been marketed. This, this is a horror comic, end to end. You want to call it a horror comic? Here's a horror comic you can go call it. Up next, another really awesome one, Snowman Comics. So, this is what started it all for me. Here is my copy. In 2019, two years ago, I found this. At the time, this was the only copy known to exist in the universe of Snowman Comics. Snowman Comics, published by Crestwood Publishing, same as Tally Ho. Company does not exist, as far as we know. 26 Denison Square, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, French Canada, all Ontario copyright in Canada. This is the first work by John, by sorry, by Frank Frazetta that was published. It was redrawn and it was inked by John Gianta. And Frank Frazetta came up with the character. He probably did the cleanups and erasing, just like all the other artwork by John Gianta. This is so supremely rare. That when I found this, this is what got me collecting these books. Is I wondered how can this be Frank Frazetta's first published work, and nobody knows that this Canadian edition exists. I have the only copy that is known to exist on the planet. Now there are two copies known to exist in the entire universe here. These are both of those copies. There is the actual cover, Tally Ho Comics. Here's the original artwork for Tally Ho Comics. See some white out there, that's where the original work. This was sold May 7th, 2020, Weiss Auction, Lot 301. This sold for $4,250 last year. The original cover for Tally Ho Comics number one. See, it's also been reported that a reason why Frank has had a left Bailey, it says he left there in 1946. Bailey, well, I'm not even so sure about that because Bailey Publishing shut down in 1946. They ceased to operate. I don't know if Frank said it actually left or if they just closed their doors and stopped, and that's why he had to find work elsewhere. But anyway, so there's the original artwork for the cover. You can see on the back of that original cover, there's some rough work here. It's unknown if this was John Gianta or if any of this was done by Frank Frazetta. There's some more artwork that was found on some other pages. Also unknown if any of this is Frank Rosetta or if it's all John Gianta. This is how you know it's not an American version of the book. Down at the bottom, the original Snowman, it had a credit, lettering designs by H.G. Ferguson. That credit was removed from the black color plate when they printed this and they added their own indicia. So you, there's no way you can remove that. So there's not a remainder of an American copy. Oh, here's something neat too. Like, if you see mine, mine has a 60 price on it, and this one up here has a blacked out price. I've not seen that before. But wait, another thing you can see is that all over my 60 price, it's delaminating, because there was a round sticker that was covering it. It was a different price sticker. And the person, that one person who I saw selling a copy of that Mr. Lucifer in Canada, his copy came with these stickers that fell off it of 9D and 1 shilling. So, guaranteed that a big 9D round price sticker was on this at one time and sold for a higher price. Now, something else really cool about Snowman Comics. Snowman Comics, they had a hardcover book come out and they reprinted this from Tally Ho. This book here, Frank Frazetta's The Adventures of the Snowman, featuring a forward by Frank Frazetta Jr. This came out, it was published in the United States in 2015. So this is only six years old. 2015. It was advertised in 2015, just a few years ago, as this is the first time it has been reprinted. Because they had no idea Bailey Publishing sold the rights to all this artwork to Canadian Company Century, even just a few years ago when they published this. They thought that this was the first reprinting. It's not. This would be the first reprinting a year later in 1946 up here in Canada. But they're so extremely rare, nobody knows about these. So that's really cool. We'll go get through this. This is Tally Ho, number one. Well, like I was saying, this is Tally Ho number one. It's reported that 
uh, Frank Zetta didn't like, like not getting the recognition he felt he deserved with this one shot, Tally Ho. Tally Ho is not a one shot. None of these comics were one shots. They were series. There was a whole second snowman story that was penciled and inked, was not silver printed. So it was never published. There was other artwork from other stories that was labeled at the top of the artwork, Tally Ho number two, not published, not silver printed. We got He-Man. Man in Black. Where's that story? Can I move there? Okay, so here's another comic we're at now. So this is another overprinted one. Cisco Kid Comics. Cisco Kid published by Century Publishing Company, 232 Danvers Street West, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, printed in Canada. So this, I thought this was going to be in the Navy. Wasn't sure. Exactly what this is, but this is Cisco Kid Comics by Bailey Publishing. And here is the original cover art to Cisco Kid Comics. This was sold, the original cover art, May 7th, 2020, by Weissen for $2,000. The original cover art. And it says appearances by Funny Man, Super Baby, and Fox inside. So that's what this is Cisco Kid Comics. Once again, the American version had this cover, Canadian version. Never had a cover. It was overprinted. Oh, there's a super baby. Christmas in Mexico story. Fost. You'll die laughing. Here's Funny Man. Jinx. Here's another whole different comic. Another one I have. Here you go, right here. The Jinx. This is Jerry Jones, the Jinx. So I guess this is actually really cool because this is one of the ones that was never published by anyone else ever. This is Trophy Comics number one. Nobody else published this. So if you want to read this, you have to go get a copy of, of this self-covered version that's only to be bought in the UK where it's distributed. This is one of the more rare ones. So that's what Trophy Comics cover should have looked like. Unfortunately, they did not use the John Gunther cover. I think it's a pretty cool cover. I like that cover. That was sold November 19th, 2020. For four thousand dollars, the original cover art to that. Fantastic! I love that cover art. Here's the first story, the Jinx. Here's the original art for the Jinx, right here. The Jinx original art just sold April fourteenth, twenty twenty one. This year, twelve hundred dollars for the full story of Trophy Comics number one, the Jinx. Now. If anyone who this thinks that this looks a bit familiar, I'll tell you why. This here, which is the cover now, because it's coverless, so this is self-covered. This cover was already redone on a different cover. It's a complete swipe of Cannonball Comics from March 1945. You can see they got a lot less detail on the devil. They're not clutching people anymore. And they redrew the character here. It is now the Jinx, Jerry Jones. So I guess it's a Canadian superhero, really because it was only published here in Canada. Look through the stories in this one. See, here's another one where I don't know what to call this, because technically this is Trophy Comics. So this should be Trophy Comics number one, the, the Canadian edition. But the way that they titled them, this is just the jinx. It's the first story. Now the title of the comics is what they use, but they usually put the title of uh, the word comic underneath. So it'll be Jinx Comics, and the indicia would be Jinx Comics. Well, this does not have a title in the indicia, does not have the comic stamped over it, 
The first story is the jinx. So do we call this comic the jinx? Or do we call it Jinx Comics? Like they reworked all the other titles? Or is this Trophy Comics number one Canadian edition? I don't know. It's really cool though to have this. We'll go through this too. I have some other stories in here to show you. It's the original artwork for it. So there is a Jinx. Stout Heart. There is the original artwork for Stout Heart. This sold November 2020, $675 for the original artwork. Or by Bruce Elliott, Zandu. So now this is really cool. Look at this. Here's the original artwork for Zandu. This was sold November 19th, 2020, $3,100 for the original artwork to this story. This story, the original artwork, this was done by Jack Alderman, signed here, who is a Canadian artist. So, Canadian artist, only published in Canada, this book, distributed in the UK. So, that would make Zandu as a Canadian superhero. <laughs> it's, it's done by a Canadian artist, and it's a Canadian published book. Well, Zandu, here, here's first page. Original artwork. You can see it here at the top of the Zandu page. It was slated to be in Pot O Gold. So this book was actually originally called Pot O Gold. And on the original artwork on the cover for Trophy Comics, you can see the title has been altered. It used to be Pot O Gold Comics, and they changed Pot O Gold to Trophy. And here it is Pot O Gold crossed off, and Trophy number one written on the original artwork. Now, what's cool about this also is there's another character called Zandu. There was a character, Zandu, by Marvel Comics 20 years later. Zandu came out in. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number Two, and here is Zandu, the American version, twenty years later, compared to the Canadian version. It's got some pots burning in the background, another fire there, some fire there. And we got some pillars. We got some pillars. We're wearing a cape. He's got a wand. Wearing a cape, got a wand. Complete swipe of the Canadian <laughs> superhero Zandu by Mark. Found in Marvel Comics, Amazing Spider-Man, Annual Number Two, Zandu. This is Zandu's first appearance, allegedly, and here's the real first appearance of Zandu, only published by Century Publications. No one else published this story by Bailey. We got Captain Cutlass. So here's original artwork, Captain Cutlass. This story sold November 19th, 2020, $675 US for the full story. Like I said, these are all Weiss auctions. Weiss said in all auctions, probably not published. So all the people who bought all of these stories have no idea that these were all published in these Canadian comics that I'm showing you right now. So if somebody ever wants to get a hold of Weiss and let them know that all the stuff was published, or if you have any friends that have bought any of this artwork, you let them know to watch this video. They'll see where the artwork actually goes and where it came from. It was published. Okay, here's a whole other book now. All right. So, this is Splash Waters, published by Superior. It says, published by Superior Publishers Limited, Century Publication at the top. Superior Century, same place. Splash Waters. So, let's take a look at this one next. This book they come from is actually called Barrel O Fun. Barrel O Fun. Never published under that title. Here's the first story. Splash Waters, original artwork, sold November 19, 2020 for 675 bucks. The original story. You can see the original artwork for Splash Waters. At the top is the title Barrel of Fun Number One. Now, this barrel
Barrel of Fun number one actually was reprinted. Barrel of Fun number one was retitled Full of Fun by IW Super when they republished all kinds of comics in uh, 1958, I believe. There you go, right there. Full of Fun is a reprint of Barrel of Fun. I'm not sure if we call this Barrel of Fun, or if we call this Full of Fun, or if we just call this Splash Waters Comics. I'm, I'm not sure, once again, what the title of these books. But Grand Comic Database, it says right here, where is it printed? Most likely Bernard Bailey studio material from the mid 40s. Yes, it was. It was 1945, like all the rest of the artwork, published by, in Canada here, 1946. But there was no mention of this being published. This book right here, 1946, it is thought that Full of Fun is the first and only printing. But it's not, it's a reprint of this Barrel of Fun number one. see what's inside here. It's already seen it, already happened to the reprint by IW. Sugar and Spice. Does anyone? Sugar and Spice sold September 29th, 2021 by Weiss from Barrel Fund. $525 for original art. And it was noted in the Grand Comment database also about this Sugar and Spice that uh, It says, Indexer Notes, does this predate in the original, the DC series Sugar and Spike? Yes, it does, because this is the original, published 1946. It was created in 1945. It does predate the original Sugar and Spike by DC Comics. Brady Fox. Monkey Tales. Comic Papers. Magical Monk. Okay, here's a whole other comic again. Fire Top Comics. Although in Indicia, this is funny. I know what this is. Okay, so what this is, this is Slapstick Comics. There it is, published Slapstick Comics. This is the cover that was never published on the Canadian version. This is on the American version. Here's the original art for the American version. Pretty cool. This was sold November 19th, 2020 for $875, the original artwork for Slapstick Comics. So now, the original first page, you can see here, the first page had an entire paragraph underneath where it says Firetop. They removed the entire paragraph to stamp this with the word comics. Because so most of the other books, they put the word comics in, and then they change, they make an indicia, so it would be Fire Top Comics would be the name. They take away a whole paragraph, put in the word comics, but in the indicia, it's not even called Fire Top Comics. It's just Fire Top. <laughs> you gotta go with the indicia if it has one. So this comic is just called Fire Top. Ten gallon per Williger. Oh, I have that here. Here's the original artwork for ten gallon per Williger right here. This sold November nineteenth, twenty twenty, for two hundred and twenty dollars. Five pound steak, Stone Age stand, Laundry Man. So here's another one. Here's the original artwork for Laundry Man. Slapstick number one, this sold November 19th, 2020 for $400. Dr. Mercy, so here's one I have. So I know what this one is. So this here is actually Zoom Comics. It was published in the States. This was published, that's a cover that it came with in the States. 
can paint version. No cover ever had on it, but that's the cover it should have been on it in Zoom comics. I have this comic, I have a couple copies of it right here. Same comic. Dr. Mercy's the first story. This is the Canadian edition here. Once again, the edition has no title, so this might be Zoom Comics, Canadian edition. I don't know, is it, it might be Dr. Mercy. Uh, it was written here by Dennis Gifford, Red Band, because it's it, Dr. Mercy is in Red Band Comics also. These ones I don't think are Red Band though, because the Red Band comics actually have a red band across all of the all the squares. This one is Zoom Comics. So you can make it uh, labeled next to its name. Slapstick had slapstick written on it in pencil also. Um, so, okay, so here's Red Band. So here's Red Band right here. So these are actually from Red Band Comics also. They republished stuff in a few places, so this might have also been in Red Band Comics. But it was definitely also in Zoom Comics. This is Tanner's. You want a boogeyman story? Boogeyman deals the cards. Two O'Leary. Oh, so this is another comic we're at now. Okay, I have this as well. That's how I know what this one is. This one had a cover in the UK. So this is not a coverless one. This one was. Bombardier Comics. That's the cover that would have came on in UK 90 price on it. What it was is Bailey published this. It was called B29 the Bombardier. They took that off because B29, these funny animals, have nothing to do with what's inside this comic. The cover is totally unrelated. Even though Century bought the interior comics for Bombardier Comics with all the funny animal stories, and they sold it with a different cover on it that had nothing to do with it. Also, like a teen romance cover. I don't know. But this is Bombardier Comics. This is the first story, so it should have had this cover. The cover was removed by somebody at some point. It is a coverless comic. Here's my copy. My copy, the cover was ripped off also at some point. It's missing a cover. You see it is written here, Knockout by Dennis Gifford. That's because this here is Knockout Comics number one. Okay, so if you look at, uh, I don't know, I have way back here somewhere on the Comic Book Daily website on that article there by Ivan Kaufman, right? It mentions this comic and it has pictures of all the page stories in this comic. And it says that he thinks that it might be British uh, published because Knockout was the title of a British publication back then. It was like a newspaper style comic. But no, no, it has nothing to do with any kind of British comics at all. This was called by Bailey Publications in the United States, Knockout Comics Number One. It's just when it was published here in Canada, because nobody else published this, there was no Knockout Comics Number One published in the United States, only published in Canada, and they put a mix and match cover for Bombardier Comics on top of Knockout Comics Number One. But this is Knockout Number One. So there's Lee Vicky's the first story. You can see right there at the top of the original art, knockout number one, written right at the top. This sold May 7th, 2020, 380 bucks. Bold Buccaneer. So here's the original, the Bold Buccaneer. Also at the top, knockout number one. This sold November 19th, 2020, $200 for the whole story. High stakes. Johnny Rex. Here's Johnny Rex, the original art. This story sold April 14th, 2021. $270 for the story. And like I said, all these stuff, the stuff that sold at Weiss Auctions, no, the Weiss Auctions does not know that these were published. They have no idea that these Canadian comics came out. People who buy our work have no idea this our book was published. Because this, this book here, this knockout number one that was covered as Bombardier Comics, no one else published.
only just except for Canada and sent it over to the UK. So in North America, here in Canada, in the United States, nobody knows that these stories were published. So we have a Mr. Miracle. Here's the original artwork, Mr. Miracle, sold by Spy Weiss, April 14th, 2021, $2,500. That actually did pretty good, $2,500. Last page, and boom. So there is the entire Dennis Gifford bound volume that we've gone through. I'll go through some other stuff real quick with you too. There are some comics Dennis Gifford did not have. That I have found a few of them. Also redone was Funland Comics by Bailey Publishing. The first story being Skunky Shopkeeper. You can see that this mine has a one shilling sticker, Century Publication, published by Superior Publishers. So there is no title in the indicia. Once again, it's Funland Comics number one, the Canadian edition. Uh, you can call it Skunky Shopkeeper Comics or Skunky Shopkeeper or Funland Comics number one. That's one that he did not have in his bound volume. Another one he did not have, Conqueror Comics. I have a couple of them here. It's fairly common. There's another one I've, there's on the internet right now that you can get. It's been on the internet for almost a year now. It's missing the staple. So no one's bought it yet. There's Conqueror Comics. So this was also 1946. Overstamped edition, also not in his collection. Unless it's in another bound volume. He might have had several bound volumes. Another, not in his collection, Golden Lad. So this is Golden Lad number one. I have three copies here. That's what the original cover looked like of Golden Lad. These were sent, made coverless. What's different about this, I'm not sure why this is, but there's a Golden Lad, Century Publications stamped on it. And there's an indicia at the bottom. There's no title in the indicia, so I don't know if it says Golden Lad number one or Golden Lad Comics, whatnot. Then I have this other copy. It has the same stamps, but it also has a price, 6D price, overprinted, that this one does not have. Which is very strange. I figured that they would all have the exact same overprinting on them. But they don't. And then I found this one that has no overprinting. It's blank. There's no indicia. There's no logo stamp. There's no 6D price stamp. There's no century publication stamp. This one was missed which is incredibly rare, I would think, that this one would get missed because they have to prove that these are Canadian comics and not American comics that they are distributing because of the trade embargo. I don't know how in the printing process one of these would get totally missed and get out in circulation, so that's got to be fairly rare. And you can tell these are not the American version. Here's a, inside of the American. The American version had a full indicia that took up this entire box. So for them to publish these without that indicia, that, that was removed from the black printing thing, and they put in their own indicia and their own overprinting. That's what that has. We got some other neat stuff here too, just so you can see. You know, with these superior comics, it was said that like they had fake covers made up. They did not have fake covers made up. What it is is they mix and match their covers. It didn't make any sense. I, 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 I have no idea what they were thinking about, eh? But here's Century Publications. They published Jeep Comics number two. But this is not Jeep Comics number two inside. Inside this is the story pages for Golden Lad number three. So if you actually want to read Jeep Comics number two, a different Canadian publisher, F.E. Howard, bought the inside story pages for Jeep Comics number two, and they published them in their own book with a circus cover over top for some reason. But inside of this circus cover, Circus Prey Comics, is Jeep Comics number two. But Century, they mix and match the covers. So like the few covers they got from Bailey, because they only got, a, they did get a few of them, but they put them on completely different books that they did not belong with, which is just makes things so much more difficult to index these comments. So then I'll also show you the 
here. So we have some more coverless comics that were also not in that collection. We have Zorro the Mighty. So this is an actual Canadian hero that's totally made in Canada, public Canada. So there's Zorro the Mighty. I have two copies of it, Zorro the Mighty, number two. I do not have Zorro the Mighty number one. Uh, Zorro the Mighty number one actually had a cover. It was a reused American cover. So there's Zorro the Mighty comics number one. The first actual Zorro the Mighty comics, I can tell you. I have this comic on the way, actually. Captain Commando is the cover they put on it, which was a different cover that was used by the, in the States. But they put this cover on it. Inside it was half reprints of American comics and half pure new Canadian material. And it was made like a Canadian white comic in 1945 or so this was made. So the inside interior is all black and white. And it had the first appearance of Zorro the Mighty in black and white inside. So I have that on the way. But then he appeared here is the first appearance of Zorro the Mighty. They colorized it. They put it in color and they actually put an actual cover on it titled Zorro the Mighty Comics. But what that actually was, was they took Blazing Comics, number three, and they changed the title to Zorro the Mighty Comics. So, Zorro the Mighty number one had a cover. The cover was not for Zorro the Mighty number one. <laughs> then I have Zorro the Mighty number two. And then what we have here is Zorro the Mighty number three. This is another very rare one. There's only one other I could find uh, uh, to compare this to online on the internet. And they were published here in Canada, Chubbis, but it was actually reprinted in the United States, once again, by IW Super Reprints. They reprinted it as Fantastic Adventures. Fantastic Adventures number 12, IW Super. They redid the, this whole new cover for it. And if you look on the Grand Comic Database, another mistake again, because nobody knows about these Canadian comics. So here we go, correcting some more mistakes and making some more comic history here, folks. <laughs> it is stated that it is not reprints. Yes, it is. Not reprints. It says unpublished Harry A. Chesler material. Well, no, it is published by Century Publications Superior Comics. It says, more than likely, this would have been Zorro the Mighty Comics number three. Yes, it was. It, it's even in the indicia. Zorro the Mighty Comics, volume one, number three. This is Zorro number three. It says, the next to last panel of Zorro Mighty Comics number two has Ravax edition of Parship is Zorro in battle against Imperman. The last panel of Zorro and Parship, those panels tie into the synopsis. So, yes, so this is Zorro number three. It's saying that this is the original and that it was unpublished material, but it's not. This was published by Century Publications as a coverless comic in 1946. And. They did some more Zora stories. They covered them in other comics, so uh, Astounding Jungle Adventures has a Zora story. And Red Seal Comics has a story with Zora. They made up a Zora the Mighty Comics cover that was never used. That I know of. There's a whole story you can find online of Zora the Mighty that was unpublished, never used. That was all inked, ready to go. And on top of all that, we look at some other cool stuff here. So here is the stuff by Weiss Auctions that was actually unpublished. All right, so close that, put that away. So here, they sold this recently. This is Snowman number two. This would have been in Tally Ho Comics number two. It was an entire story, unpublished, by Frank Frazetta, John Gianta, meant for Tally Home Number 2. And this whole story was later sold. So this was sold May 7th, 2020. It was estimated that this story would fetch thirty dollars to $50,000. It sold for only $14,000, May 7th, 2020. It sold, actually went up the auction on Heritage. Shortly after selling, someone flipped it. A few minutes later, the Heritage, I don't know what it sold for at Heritage, but it sold for 14000 from the Bailey Archives sold by Weiss Auctions. They also sold a bunch of other stuff, just random items, 
stuff that went unpublished, just penciled. Muscles Malone, Pan Compete, Jungle Juno, just Pan Compete, Muscles Malone. Just a bunch of random. It all sold for okay money, like a couple hundred bucks each, a few hundred bucks each for those things. Here's, remember I said make believe was not used? Here's a story. Make believe number three, written on the top of the original art. It doesn't even have a title for the story. Never used. Another series by Bailey Publishing, never published. Once Upon a Time. This is from Once Upon a Time Comics, number three, never used. Trophy Comics, the one with the jinx on the cover. Trophy Comics number four, story, Tommy Time. They never made a Trophy Comics four, three, or two. This is from Tally Ho, Mr. and Mrs. September. So this would have been Tally Ho number two. It doesn't say number two on it, but it would have been number two with the second snowman story. This was pink and almost ready to go. Here's another one, World Beater, Great Gazabo. There's a bunch of Great Gazabos. Spook. So this was for Spook Comics number two. It doesn't have number two, but it was not in number one of Spook Comics. Another one, Make Believe, number two, from my series, not done. Another Hamilton Swift Esquire, Spook Comics at the top, also unpublished. Here's the Daffodils, label at the top, Trophy Comics, number two. So the Jinx, here's number two, Trophy Comics, number two. Another Daffodil story, Daffodil story, here's some more Great Gazabo. Here's some Peanuts MacDroop. Now, it says Once Upon a Time at the top. I have read that Peanuts MacDroop is in that Circus Comics that has that, uh, that advertisement in it for the self-covered coverless comics. So this might have been in Circus Comics. I don't have a copy to verify that. Got some Kid Galahad, Ryan Steele. Here's a cool looking one. It just says a sword. It doesn't say it doesn't say what comic it's on, but curtain call. That's got a pretty cool looking splash page on it there. Curtain call story. Here's a cover for as far as I know, totally unpublished, once again cover. Once upon a time comics. So this is a 128-page giant. Once upon a time comics. So this is probably gonna be number one. There's no yet yeah, got number one on it. So here's what once upon a time comics number one should have looked like. This sold May 7th, 2020 for 600 bucks. There's also a Tommy Thumb Comics number one, unpublished, never heard of it. That's the cover art for it. Sold for 550 on May 7th. We got a Funny Man story. As far as no one published, it's not the one from Cisco Comics. Cisco Kid Comics, that's a different one. That's some more unused art. Here's some cool unused art by Dan Barry, The Giants of Gravitra. The Giants of Gravitra. This sold for $1,100 on May 7th, 2020. We got the Wall of Jericho. Here's another cool looking one. Planet X. That's a cool looking one. Story sold May 7th, 2020, $725. Sci fi comic looks pretty cool. We got some more, another Mr. and Mrs. September story. This one also labeled Tally Ho. So this is a, not Tally Ho number one. It's one of the future editions. This sold November 19th, 2020 for 625 for the story. We got a Kid Galahad story. Be aware. More daffodils. Daffodils. Here's a story from Once Upon a Time Comics number two. It's listed as at the top. Special Jabberwocky. Here's one from Make Believe. So once again, so so there's one that was in the uh, Make Believe comics. As far as I know, unpublished. This sold September 29th, 2021 for 110 bucks. It's a super baby story. It's listed as Make Believe Comics at the top. And then here's that Kid Galahad story, or sorry, this Kid Galahad, Little Sir Richard story. Little Sir Richard sold September 29th, 2021 for 200 bucks. And it's listed as Once Upon a Time, number two, is what it's supposed to go into, but it, they also, once again, they never published Once Upon a Time. 
That's all the pile of artwork that was all sold, Weiss Auctions, from the Bailey Archives. They did some other cool covers as well. There's John Gianta with help by Frank Rosetta, probably. They did, he did Prize Comics cover here. Hurricane, that was sold in the UK. There's another Prize Comic. Another Prize Comics. This is all, all John Gianta, so probably assisted by Frank Rosetta with cleanups. And here is the second appearance of Jerry the Jinx Jones from Trophy Comics number one. John Gianta did this cover, so this probably would have been used for Trophy Comics number two, as a guess. But this is instead used on Roly Poly number 10, and there is Jerry the Jinx Jones. And what's kind of funny is the first story in this comic is about a couple of jinxes, of all things. And it has the Canadian superhero Jerry the Jinx Jones making his first cover appearance, sorry, sorry his second cover appearance. And his second only appearance because he was not inside any other comic that I've ever seen. I've never seen another Jerry the Jinx story yet. But there he is on Roly Poly Comics number 10. So, that's all I got for you. I don't know why in the world Century would ever have tried Colitis selling these covers comics. I've been asked this. I know in the UK, in British times, back then in the 40s, they had a lot of newspaper style comics where you know, it's strips on newsprint, not even stapled, just fold over. It's, it's like a newspaper pullout almost. But a lot of their comics were like that. So I'm wondering if maybe Century thought, you know what, maybe we can get away with selling these comics that have no glossy covers on them. Because there's so many comics over there already that don't have glossy covers. Maybe it'll be accepted. But it was not very well accepted. <laughs> but another thing is, this is their first year publishing comics for Century Publications. So maybe they could not afford to pay for the cover art. They couldn't buy the cover art. They had to buy the inside for probably pretty cheap, but the money that they wanted for covers, well, no, we're just gonna take these few covers, but we'll, we'll take all the insides of the books. But they just didn't have the funding available because this was their first story into comics. So like, here in Toronto in the 40s during the war times, Century Publications, Superior Comics, they made joke books. They made army joke books. And then they made other funny joke books where it was just like a one-liner with a cartoon illustration above it. It was just joke books they were publishing from like 1940 or 41 until 1945. 1946, when Century Publications came out with these, these are the first line of comic books that Superior Comics, Century Publication, produced. And it wasn't even for a Canadian market. It was for a British market where they wanted to test filling that vacuum where they could get American produced comic books shipped over to London, England. When at the time there was trade embargoes, so the Americans couldn't ship them there themselves. They acted as a middleman to start off the company and ship the comics over there. But like I said, people didn't really want, they wanted the glossy covers. And for like the ones that have a sticker on them for a shilling price, you could get comics double that size in in London, England, for that price. Like that was a lot of money, a shilling for, you know, you're paying a shilling for a half size comic compared to what they're selling over there, and no cover on it. So they were just, just disposed of. They were looked down upon. They were thrown out all over the place. So nobody really collected these. Nobody looked into the history of these. Nobody researched them until now that I've researched them. And now we all know what these are. This 1946 line, Century Publications bought all the artwork from Bailey Publishing in New York. And then they published it all and shipped them all out to London, England to test the markets out there. So I hope you liked this video. It was a long time going through this all. Glad you stuck around. I know some of you are checking out the comics behind me. Got some cool stuff. You can see all that. I know there's a lot of foreign comic collectors out there that are probably eyeing up some of these comics as well. Because I don't know if everyone noticed this or not, but I got 24 comics up here. Ten of them are not American comics, original U.S. printing. There are seven British comics, two Canadian comics, and an Australian comics mixed in. Now, bonus points for anyone who can guess which ones those are. But as you can see, I'm a collector of not just American regular comics. I collect the Canadian, the British, and some Australian as well. Everything has to be in English, though. I'm a comic reader. I read all the books. So... That's why I only collect the English written comic books. So what I gotta do now is 
I have 700 pages of comics. I'm going to read this entire bound volume end to end. And I can't wait to get into it. So, hope you all enjoy it. Thanks.